the reason is that they're afraid their kids, something bad would happen to their kids, which is just this really hyperinflated sense of danger, or that their kids would be frustrated or unable to do these things, which as we've discussed before, is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you never let them go do anything, they don't know how to do anything. And anxiety is a cycle as well, which is like, oh, I worry that my kid might get lost or be hurt or scared or frustrated. So I'm not going to let them go. And then the kid starts thinking, well, I guess my parents don't trust me. I must be too, you know, dumb or endangered or incompetent or just why would I ever do that? That sounds like something for an adult. And then the parents see the kid who's not saying, let me, you know, please let me ride my bike to Houghton. <laughs> please let me go to the store. Please let me do something on my own. And then you add into the mix the fact that they can go anywhere without their parents and have fantastic adventures and hang out with their friends and make jokes and play games on a little screen, they don't have to leave. So it just becomes a, um, you know, sort of the wall E <laughs> existence where you're in your chair and you've got your, your drink in your drink cup and you're watching something fun and that's it. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Zimmerman and that is Lenora Skenazy from the Let Grow organization and the book Free Range Kids. Let's get right to it with Lenore. Lenore, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Well, thank you, John. You go by John, right? I do. <laughs> okay, that's <Yes>. easy. <laughs> I'm not a Jonathan, but I'm a John. Okay. Got it. <laughs> Hey, I, I love giving my guests just an opportunity to introduce themselves. Please take about 30 seconds and tell the audience who the heck you are. Oh, sure. Um, well, if you Google America's Worst Mom, there I am. I got that name because I let my nine-year-old, uh, you active towns, people will appreciate this, ride the subway by himself. I wrote a column about it. And two days later, I was on the Today Show, MSNBC, Fox News, and NPR, Um and that's when I started my blog, Free Range Kids, to say, actually, our kids are safer and smarter than our culture gives them credit for. And then about five years ago, Jonathan Haidt, who's popular now because of the anxious generation, and Daniel Schuckman, a philanthropist and, and free speech crusader, came to me and said, we have to start a nonprofit together to help kids grow up more resilient, resourceful, confident. And I said, OK. And I looped in one more person, Peter Gray who has spent his career studying the importance of free play, free independent play without parents directing every, uh, you know, every activity. And together we founded Let Grow, not Let It Grow, not Let's Go, not like Let It Go, like the song, it's just, it's just Let Grow. I love it, I love it, yes. And in fact, we've got the, the website uh, ready to go right here. And uh, and when you, we scroll down, we see that there's lots and lots of wonderful um, information here on the movement and what you all are trying to do. And as you mentioned, you you sort of this has been a bit of an evolution of going from what was sort of branded under free range kids and uh, and that and that was what was that like 12 years ago when uh, free range kids well, the nine year old is 26. So do the math. <laughs> yeah. So it's been a while. Now take us back. Take us back to that original initial moment, um, and it was your younger son, right, Max? Or no, Izzy. Izzy, very good. Oh my goodness, yeah. Did your research? Yeah. So Izzy was nine. He'd been bugging me and my husband to let him take the subway home from someplace that we dropped him off at that he'd never been at before. And finally, we decided, okay. And so one sunny Sunday, I took him to a fancy department store, Bloomingdale's, a nice part of town. And I said, okay, goodbye. I'm going the other way. <laughs> and I left him there because it's right above a subway stop. We're on the subways all the time. That's how we get around. And so he did it. He went down to the subway. He found his way to 34th Street, which is the Miracle Street, and then also a very slow bus street. And the bus slowly goes across town and finally deposits you <laughs> at our apartment complex. And he came into the house um, apartment you know, levitating with pride, with relief that he'd been allowed to do something, not relief that he was alive, but relief that like a milestone had been reached. But I didn't write about it immediately because it was our milestone. It wasn't for public consumption or anything. But a couple months later, when I had nothing to write about, I wrote about why I let my nine-year-old ride the subway alone. And that was the inciting incident. Yeah. 
You must have felt like you just caught a tiger by a tail when that all sort of unraveling and, and people started, you know, calling on you and inviting you to come on the Today Show and other shows, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I was I was happy about it um, in, in one sense in that I I'd spent my career as a newspaper reporter most of the time at the New York Daily News. And I feel like I have reality on my side. I mean, I would travel around the city all the time. Sometimes I would get off the at just a random subway stop and I wouldn't let myself go back until I had found a story. And by a story, I mean something inspiring and great, not a crime, not, not a tragedy. It was always like, oh my God, this guy started, he made his own line of perfume since 1922, or this guy is blind and he's a gym teacher, or wow, this lady started her own business. Uh, this guy does murals of local people. And so I felt like rather than living in my head and living in um, like the land of those who, you know, consume a lot of scary, the first part of the paper is all tragedy. And then there comes the second part of the paper. And I always wrote for the second part of the paper, which is, you know, recipes and interesting dog stories and funny things and contests and um, just all the parts that I loved. And I, I felt like I have met so many people in so many neighborhoods that people say, oh my God, I would never go there. It's like, well, I've gone there and I've met the guy who made his own perfume or the lady who's, a, you know, the blind gym teacher. And so uh, it was gr it was a great opportunity for me to bring people into what I've actually seen and also done my research on, which is crime not, not being nearly the issue that people make it to be and certainly not stranger danger and child snatchings, which I think that's sort of faded at the moment. I think that people are a little less worried about the man in the white van, maybe because they become so um, so used to never letting their kids out of the house that it doesn't even you know <laughs> rise as an issue. And now everybody's worried instead about their kids on screens. And I'm like, well, if you knew that the man in the white van wasn't a problem and you do think that screens are a problem, let's flip it. And how about instead <laughs> of protecting your kids from the man in the van, you, you open the door <laughs> and you let the kids out. And then they're actually in the world having adventures and they're pretty safe. Nobody's ever perfectly safe anywhere. You could, you know, fall down the stairs. So today, the, the piece I'm writing and, oh yeah, here I have it. So some lady wrote to me yesterday and sent me, let me see if I can find it. The, the rules that her local police department, she's in a town in Indiana that's one of the 10 safest towns in Indiana. <laughs> so we're already in Indiana and then we're safe. And the police department wrote, dear parents and guardians, as we begin the summer break, and you know, it's not going to be like, let kids roam. It's great. We all remember our childhoods. Hallelujah. Let them out. It's uh, well, uh, school will have more free, uh, children will have more free time and may be tempted to explore new areas try new things and do things they wouldn't normally do. <laughs> it's like, isn't that good? <laughs> yeah, right. Thumbs up, right. And uh, of course they say that's terrible and that, you know, be out, be on the alert for that. You know, don't have your supervision, make supervision maybe more relaxed, which is bad. And then they say to, to the police department. And then they say, um, it's essential to know the friends and families of your children's peers and ensure responsible adults supervise any activities or outings. And, and that's a lie. It is not essential to have adults supervising everything that children do. And in fact, I think that's why children are going crazy. And I also think that's why they're going to screens because in screens, they have freedom and their parents aren't there. And also they have none of that in the outside world. So I'm writing this little piece going like, like, so what would it mean if you're, if adults were supervising every summer activity, like this suggests of any, any child, it's like, I'll just sit here in the corner of your tree house. You know, you guys can do your pinky blood brothers without me. I, I won't notice. Oh, don't you want to wash your hands? Oh yeah. Well, here I brought some more, you know, having an adult there changes literally everything. And to pretend otherwise is to be, uh, is to belie your own reality. Look at your childhood. Would you wish you'd been, you wish your mom had been pedaling and you'd been on the back of the bike, you know, as you went to the beach or the library or to the, the quarry or to the, the vacant lot, you know, do you wish, wish your mom was sitting there as you climbed things? Do you wish she always brought a snack and, and the wipes and, uh, you know, an educational book and pointed out that like, oh, you're climbing a brick wall. Brick was originally invented and you, you don't, 
you don't need that. You don't want that. And in fact, it ruins so much of the child development that's supposed to be going on when you do things with friends on your own, figuring stuff out, even figuring out risk. So I'll just natter on for one more second, which is there. there's a theory that uh, presented by these three Georgetown professors that kids are getting their independence so late, like normally ages like I'd say five to 12 are sort of the years of exploration and independence, you know, doing things and like, oh, that was too scary or, oh, that was easier. Oh, I climbed higher or all these things or I dare you to doing these little risk taking activities, which is how your brain wires itself for a couple things. It starts seeing what is really dangerous and what isn't. And and it also this was just explained to me by another professor, Mariana Brussoni, who I would highly recommend talking to at the University of British Columbia. Um, It's like. You have to get used to the slight trepidation and fear, which floods your body with all these like, you know, the heart racing and the, you know, the freezing or whatever. You have to get used to that in small doses. Otherwise, anytime you do get a small dose later on, you think it's a big dose, right? Because everything is scary. And the study that was done at Georgetown asked college students in Canada and America versus Turkey and Russia to describe a a risky or a dangerous situation, a dicey situation. And in Russia, they were saying like, well, when a drunk guy is coming down the the street with a broken bottle in his hand and coming after you and, you know, singing at the top of his lungs and wants to kill someone. And then in America, they were saying like, when you're alone at a cafe (laughs) or taking an Uber. And I feel bad because you don't want kids to feel that anxious. Anxiety is the hallmark of this generation. And, and you'd be anxious too, if you were told that everything was too dangerous for you to do alone. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the big part of, of anxiety and, 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 and going to the, the, the website here, the, um, the anxious generation website. It actually looks like popcorn here. It's not it popcorn. does. <laughs> like, Facebook um, one of the, the interesting things too about anxiety is is that it's not like you were describing. It's not that that acute situation of of where you you get a quick hit of it. This is something that's pervasive, and you talk about this in your book of you know one of the challenges that that parents have, especially moms, of it's that constant level of trepidation and anxiety. And, and there's a reason why anxiety and depression are, are so closely linked, you know, um, when we look at it biologically and medically. Um, and so that it's an important thing, I think, to, to reinforce is that this is something that's just, it's there, it's out there, it's pervasive. This book, though, is is very, very interesting. I, I'm a huge Jonathan Haidt fan. I, I read everything that he puts out. I usually get it on Audible and I walk around the neighborhood and listen to it. Uh, his, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, yeah, and I want to tell you this too. His first couple books, I was still living in Hawaii at the time. And so I was actually landscaping and doing work out in the front yard, listening to, to his books. And, uh, uh, and so when he when he put the, the last two books have been are very very much um, in theme with what we're talking about and and specifically the the anxious generation book here really prompted me to reach out to you and the, and the reason why is because you are actually you know featured in the book and he mentions you a couple of times and you're now uh, on the you know you've, you're you're mentioned here at the mission statement about the anxious generation there's Jonathan hey Jonathan and and then here you are. And he talks about that, that, that moment too, that you just mentioned of, you know, Hey, let's, we need to do something. We need to pull together an initiative, a project, a nonprofit and let grow, you know, was really born. And you mentioned it several times, the screens. And that's really what this book is really all about. But as a proxy, cause you, you had, you had mentioned it there is that, what kids have lost, what youth has lost is life in IRL, the real world, you know, out there. And, uh, and, 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 it, and it's, you know, come to, to screens. Now I'm going to say this because I'm a content creator. I'm a YouTube content creator. So I'm part of the issue. <laughs> I'm producing a lot of, I'm putting a Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to put that out there. Yeah, I get it. I get it, folks. If you're if you're if you're trolls and you're starting to say "Ah, you're just a hypocrite. No, no, no. I totally get it. I try to inspire people to, okay, now put the screens down and get outside. 
go <laughs> have some fun. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to, to kind of close that loop that that's exactly that connection. And that's how, uh, I learned about you because I've used the, the term free range kids for over a decade, but never that's read the book. Favorite. I've never had children. <laughs> I've never had children. And so okay. I've just, I, I've channeled the spirit in the ethos of free range kids because of the content that I'm creating and how we are trying to help cities get inspired to build places that really embrace all ages and abilities and get people moving in the real world. Right. So before the launch of his book, the publicists for his team said, come up with a phrase that explains where you fit in. <laughs> because we're actually at Let Grow, we're screen neutral. It's like, there's good things about screens, there's terrible things about screens. And there are a million people talking about screens and writing about screens and fighting screens. I'm speaking at a group tonight. Um, but weirdly, there aren't a million groups saying, excuse me, does anybody remember their childhood? Weren't they grateful for time outside? Weren't they happy that they got to you know, walk to school or play sometimes and not always be in an organized activity and not always be supervised and assisted? So we're that side. And the phrase that we came up with, which is, um, is this, which is to save the anxious generation, you just have to open the door and say, be home by dinner. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, in your book, um, and I can't remember if, if Jonathan has it in his book, um, but it certainly inspired me to think of some of the things that I've observed and I've, uh, have, uh, have documented over the years. And, uh, specifically when I'm traveling in the Netherlands, I'm just blown away by the, the, the freedom that, that exists out there for the younger generations. And it's, uh, and you mentioned it in the book, it's taught at a very, very young age, um, out on the streets of, of, of the Netherlands. Um, you know, they have an expectation that ch kids will be able to navigate their neighborhoods, get to school, get to their sports activities, get to, uh, their friends' houses, other meaningful destinations on their own. Uh, many of the municipalities do have, um, a test that they take uh, right around 11 or 12 years old, which can demonstrate competency that they can control their bicycle um, out on the open roadways and on the pathways and they can navigate. And, uh, and it's, well, it's a wonderful it really thing. Not till 11. I would bet it was younger. Well, by that time they're, they're, they're almost all, you know, been doing it for a long time. And so I think what it is, is, is at that level of 11, 12, that, that it's like that final check mark of, of like, okay, just not making sure that, you know, <laughs> there were some helicopter parents out there, even here in the Netherlands that were like sheltering them and they didn't learn these skills because there is that expectation that by the time they're getting into, in, into the upper grades, into high school, whatever, they're going to be traveling longer distances. The, the schools are going to be further and further out. And so a, a 10 kilometer and eight kilometer a journey to a, a, a high school is going to be that much more likely. And so I think that's probably what it is. But yeah, no, I, I see little, little ones, you know, venturing and exploring all the time. Yeah. Um, you I, know about I the have, dropping? have you heard of the dropping? I, I read, yeah, no, in your book. Yeah, yeah totally. The, yeah. the dropping is, is fabulous. Why don't you explain what the dropping is? And then I'm going to actually queue up a video that I shot uh, riding between Utrecht and uh, the village of Houghton. Uh, and, and it's just a, just a, it's kind of a chill little nature video of me riding through the countryside. And as I'm doing it, there's just like kids going, you know, passing yeah. by, like, but yeah, explain what the dropping is. Species? Are they really children? Like, are, so the dropping is a tradition that I don't know how long it goes back, but everybody remembers it from their childhood and still does it today in the Netherlands where some night, I don't know if it's all, everybody always on the same night or not. Um, Parents take a group of their kids who are like between the ages of 9, 11, 12, and a couple others and drop them, hence dropping, in the middle of a, actually at the roadside, I think, on uh, the side of a forest. And the kids must go through the woods somehow <laughs> and find their way to the base camp. And there's no adult with them. And it is a real forest. And it is really night. And off they go. And only recently they started giving one of them a phone because we live in this era when nobody can imagine children doing anything without one. 
Um, but until very recently, it was, I guess, maybe you had a compass, uh, a flashlight, maybe some matches, but you did not have an adult and you did not have a straight shot from, you know, like walking down the path and, and there's the campfire and you can see it 200 feet ahead. And the Times, New York Times did a story on this several years ago that was just amazing because um, a reporter did, I guess, follow or watched from a distance these kids wandering and they kept missing the camp. And it was 10 o'clock when they were dropped off and it was two or three in the morning when they found their way to the campfire and they were too tired to even eat. And then, of course, the reporter was there in the morning when the kids were just shoveling of food. And they said, what happened? It's like, well, you know, it was really hard and it was confusing and it was cold and a little scary. But what could we do? <laughs> and that was so amazing because what could they do? They could only rely on themselves. And the confidence that the kids get from that must be superb. But the confidence that the parents have and then have reinforced is really great. And maybe you don't even have a ton of confidence in your kids to begin with. But it is the social norm to let them go. And by letting them go, then you get this real euphoric hit of like, look at what my kid can do. What? It was 3 a.m. You know, they'd just been wandering around. They'd been scared. They'd heard weird noises. They were lost. They were sad. They were worried. But they had to persevere. That's my kid. And that does wonders for the parent sense of what their kid is capable of. And I thought the most poignant part of that article was that um, the reporter talked to several Dutch parents who were surprised that this was not done everywhere. They thought, of course, this is just, you know, a rite of passage. And one of the things John has made me think about, uh, John Haidt, is he has studied a lot of the wisdom of ancient cultures, you know, from pre-Socrates to, I don't know, on a rent, whatever. But there's a, a, a rite of passage is such a good idea because then you and your kids are preparing for it. And what when it happens, it's away from the parents usually. It's with another group of adults who initiates the kids and says, you know, you're leaving behind childhood. You're not leaving behind your, your love for your parents or your need for your parents, but you are leaving behind your utter dependency on your parents and becoming a person in full, a person capable of an inner locus of control. And we never give kids that inner locus of control when we are with them all the times, either physically, like the police department was recommending, or electronically by constantly checking in and tracking and um, monitoring everything they do. And so the bigger picture is that we've really lost trust that our kids can do anything safely, that our communities are safe, that, that our kids will have any kind of problem solving capabilities or tolerance for the frustration or the fear. And so we jump in to help them and thereby deprive them of the opportunities they need to develop the competence, the confidence, the familiarity with a little bit of fear and frustration that they know they can get to the other side. So it's a vicious circle and, and that's what Let Grow was founded to, um, to interrupt, to bring back confidence in kids' ability to be out in the world and also in the idea that when they're playing and they're not being coached, there's not a teacher there, there's not um, somebody assisting and intervening in any kind of sticky situation, that kids can figure this out. And when they do, that's part of the building up the milestones of becoming a functioning human. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, too, that you mentioned, uh, you know, what, what John had been talking about in terms of the rites of passage. It leads me to, to, to recall that one of the things that we've done in in our society is probably the only true rites of passage that that we have for children over the last 60 70 80 years is getting a driver's license true oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. and it's interesting now too because we're seeing the data saying that the current younger generations are not following through and getting their driver's license you know, mainly because they value their screen. It's one of, it, it's, it's hard to like say, this is, yeah, this is, this is definitive. But one of the things when they say, when they say rate, rate what you value and what you think, they really, they're attached to their, their, their feet, their screen, their iPhone, their, 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 their you know, whatever 
phone that is. <laughs> but you know, it, it's interesting, and and I don't know that you can you can make that causation. You know, there might be a correlation there, but. What we're, we are seeing, though, is we're seeing a delaying of of the young adults, you know, becoming mobile with a car. And for those of us in the active transportation advocacy world, we're like, that's kind of okay. cool. Yeah, because so long maybe, as they're taking, like walks or bike rides. <laughs> exactly. Or, and, or, and learning or how to use transit. Yeah. yeah. And you learning how to use transit. Um, ultimately, though. I would much prefer that they not live these helicoptered sheltered lives where they don't have free range as, as younger kids, you know, into the point where, you know, they have that level of, of freedom and uh, ability to explore their communities, either solo or with their pack of friends, you know, on bikes, uh, all a kind of like, you know, for me, I'm, I'm nearly 60. So I remember as a kid doing that, of being able to explore. And I lived on a ranch. I was, I was pretty oh, far wow. outside of town. And so I would have my little pack of, of friends that were also on the neighboring ranches and whatever. And then we'd all grab our Schwinn's and, and take off and explore and bomb around on the, the gravel roads. Um, and, and getting into all sorts of other fun trouble. Um, but it, you know, it was, it was, so enriching there. So I do wonder about that, you know, that the rites of passage and, and, uh, and, and I don't, I don't know where I wanted to come go with that other than to say that, you know, one of the things that, that I was going to say is that, you know, this is that video that, that I mentioned. And so this is me just following, uh, there's a couple of middle schoolers just right ahead of me here. Lucky you weren't arrested, um, buddy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. And, him, but in the, and as you can tell, this is a two-way cycle track between the, vil- the, the city of Houghton, or ex- excuse me, the city of Utrecht and the village of Houghton. Houghton was a, an intentionally uh, built community um, that was designed in the 1970s, built in the 1980s. And it's been, you know, built as a, a quote unquote car free suburb. Um, a community. And it's not really car free. I use the square quotes because in truth, uh, the, many of the residents own vehicles, motor vehicles, but they're, uh, but they're parked around the ring. And so within the, 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 the actual village within the city, um, you know, they're, the, the cars aren't, are, aren't penetrating in. So they are, um, you know, we're, we're sort of getting to the, the, the outskirts of the village now, and you can see the, the path, the feet spot will sort of, uh, you know, wander around. Once you get into the actual village itself, you just, you're blown away by just the, the, the number of kids who are, you know, coming by and, and everything. And we just saw an older couple there, older adults going by too. And so when I, when I talk about from, from an active town's perspective of trying to, in, encourage communities to embrace this concept of mobility choice for all ages and abilities. This is kind of what I'm talking about. So, you know, whether you're talking about your eight year olds out there, uh, you know, exploring with their other eight year old friends or your, your parents or grandparents who are 88 <laughs> doing the same. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's great. It's enviable. What can I say? <laughs> you know, uh, long live Hooten. That seems just fantastic. Um, you know, the, the, I'd say there's a bunch of barriers in America to even seeing kids riding their bikes down the block or to a friend's house. Yeah. Uh, the University of Michigan um, does a poll every month uh, with the CS Mott Children's Hospital and they did one in September, and they were interested in children and independence. And they asked the parents of basically kids under age 11, you know, how important is independence? And they all said, oh, it's very important, and we want our kids to start doing more on them, their own, and on and on. And then they asked them, well, okay, let's, ask, let's find out specifically what do you allow them to do? And they asked the parents of the 9 to 11-year-olds, um, would you let them play at a park with a friend? And the majority said, oh, no. Uh, would you let them walk to a friend's house? No. Would you let them, God, what was one of the other ones? Uh, trick or treat, 85% said no, not without an adult. And 50% of them said no to the question, would you let your eight, would you let your nine to 11 year old go to another aisle at the store? So you talk about a lack of mobility. I mean, if you can't even go to another aisle at a store that's an enclosed place, <laughs> 
um, that's, that's, that's like you're frozen um, or Velcroed to your parents. And the underlying reason there, um, they asked, you know, is it danger? Is it, is it you're in a dangerous neighborhood? And 17% said yes, but the rest said no. And it's still the majority that won't let them do anything. And so the reason is that they're afraid their kids, something bad would happen to their kids, which is just this really hyperinflated sense of danger, or that their kids would be frustrated or unable to do these things, which as we've discussed before, is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you never let them go do anything, they don't know how to do anything. And anxiety is a cycle as well, which is like, oh, I worry that my kid might get lost or be hurt or scared or frustrated. So I'm not going to let them go. And then the kid starts thinking, well, I guess my parents don't trust me. I must be too, you know, dumb or endangered or incompetent or just why would I ever do that? That sounds like it's something for an adult. And then the parents see the kid who's not saying, let me, you know, please let me ride my bike to Houghton. <laughs> please let me go to the store. Please let me do something on my own. And then you add into the mix the fact that they can go anywhere without their parents and have fantastic adventures and hang out with their friends and make jokes and play games on a little screen, they don't have to leave. So it just becomes a, um, you know, sort of the wall E <laughs> existence where you're in your chair and you've got your, your drink in your drink cup and you're watching something fun and that's it. Um, but I did want to say that I, I once heard somebody say one thing about the, um, why kids aren't getting their licenses so soon. And they pointed out that it's not just uh, that they can escape to a screen and it's not just that they've had no mobility and so they don't even dream of it. Um, also, the, the graduated requirements for, um, for driving cars, like when I got my license, I could go anywhere at any time with anyone. And now it's like, well, you can't go out after nine or before five in the morning and you can only drive one relative for the first six months and then one friend and one relative for the next six months. So it's not like it's freedom handed to you with a driver's license. It's freedom with a lot of restrictions on exactly what you might want to do. And so it's like, well, great, you know, I get it. And then I still can't do anything for a year. Screw that. Yeah. Yeah. You were just talking about, you know, the, the ability to roam. And so that brought up this. Oh my God, map. my favorite story. Whenever I tweet this, it gets like a million retweets. It's, it's the most visual, wonderful thing. And I, I sort of wondered if we could do something on a large scale in America on this, or maybe your listeners could do this and send in maps um, to you, because this is the famous Daily Mail article, probably the only Daily Mail article you hear on intellectual podcasts that, um, that is how children lost the right to roam in four generations. And the reporter had the genius idea. Have you talked about this so much that I'm explaining something that everybody's seen a million times? You know, it's been a while. I had Tim Gill on and, and we were talking and this came up during his uh, episode. Yeah. Yeah. And it's his country. Anyways, it was a reporter asked a, uh, an 88 year old great grandfather how far he used to roam as a kid. And that's that giant uh, sort of boomerang shape there, that triangle. Um, which was a six mile radius. And then they asked uh, his son, who was 66, a grandpa, how far he walked. And that was the next largest circle. And then they asked the mom, who was in her 40s, how far she walked. And that was the small circle over there. Vicky, aged eight, was allowed to walk like to the swimming pool a half mile away. And then she doesn't let her son, I think, I can't remember if she doesn't let him go down the uh, further than off the block doesn't let him off the block or if he's just, if oh, yeah, only to the, the only to the end of the street, like at 300 yards. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and so what I like to pair this with um, is first of all, your own memories. Uh, but then also, so I said, like Roe was founded by four people. And one of them, I'd say one who's had a, a great deal of influence on John Haidt and you should have on your podcast is um, Peter Gray, G-R-A-Y who wrote the book Free to Learn. He's a professor of psychology and neuroscience at Boston College who has studied the importance of free play. And he wrote a piece that was uh, published in the Journal of Pediatrics this fall um, with two other scientists, anthropologists, whatever, that was called, and I can't remember the exact title, but it was basically the decline in children's mobility and the increase in um, mental issues, you know, depression, anxiety, and I would say passivity in, in the decades since the 70s. So the interesting thing about that is that it proves that it's not just correlation, that as kids' mobility went down, their, um, their depression and anxiety went up. But it was also happening before the phones, which is what makes the job of let grow 
even a little naughtier because even if you get rid of every phone, even if every parent signs a pledge, I will never give my kid a phone until they move out. (laughs) Um, First of all, I'm not sure they'll move out, but also that it's not just taking away phones that's going to change the culture because if you can't let the kids ride their bikes someplace, let them walk to the store, let them go to another aisle and get you a can of peas, if you literally can't let go, then it's actually a lot more boring and awful for the parents and the kids because it means that you just have to be with them entertaining them because they don't have their phones or taking them to an organized activity because you don't trust them with time on their own which brings me to let grows two problem solving free initiatives that we recommend that all schools and also all parents do but but we like to have schools adopt our programs because then you're changing a whole bunch of kids and a whole bunch of parents at once So the two things are this. One is the let grow experience. It's when kids get a homework assignment that says, um, go home and do something new on your own with your parents' permission. I'm trying to hold my hand there, um, but without your parents. And so they, they have to come up with something to do. And we give them a list of ideas, but of course the list is endless. You know, whatever you want to do, you can climb a tree, make dinner, go to the store, walk to a friend's house, trick or treat, (laughs) probably on October 31st. Um, And yeah, it's because you have this on a, um, I think a phone screen. Yeah. Anyways, you click on school programs and and, on a bigger screen that would have a, a thing across the top, a tab that says school programs. But anyway, so it's the let grow experience and teachers give this to the students and then it becomes um, a very easy way for a bunch of parents to let go at once because it's not their idea. They're not the crazy mom. Everyone else is doing it. The school recommends it. And we give them a lot of materials explaining the importance of independence for kids agency and this internal locus of control, the idea that I can control my life and I can make things happen. And it's it's really good um, for one's mental health. And so the kids all zoom around and they do things. There's a lot of cooking that goes on. I think we're going to fine tune the, the experience a little and say, now you have to do something outside your home. So it's not just cookies and pancakes. Um But when they do, we've just had such amazing stories. I was just reading one the other day. Um, Well, I won't tell you about that one. I'll tell you about another one, which was that in one school that was doing this, uh, it was there were there were mixed classrooms of like neurotypical and neurodiverse kids. And all the kids got the assignment. And even one kid who was intellectually disabled, a fifth grader. Um, decided for her Let Grow project, she was going to go to the store. And she wrote up a little paragraph that was so poignant. It was like, I went to the, you know, STO. It was just all misspelled. But like, it was a little confusing. And I had to take up, you know, I had a phone so I could take a picture, P-I-K-S-H-E-R, of all the food that I was getting. And it was it was hard with the checking out with money. Uh, but I did well. And I... I, I learned I am brave and I love my project. And to learn you're brave is profound. I mean, it means that the world is yours as opposed to the world is someone else's and you don't belong in it. Neurodiverse or not, that's really heady. And then you also know that what did the parents get that day? They got a kid who, you know, is a terrible speller (laughs) and didn't know her own um, worth and abilities. And, you know, oftentimes we think of disabilities in terms of the dis. (laughs) And this was showing her abilities to herself, her parents, the lady checking her out and, and her teacher and her classmates. And it's so big a deal and it is so easy to do. Any teacher can do it. All our materials are free. It doesn't take much class time and it's transformative. I hope that in some show notes somewhere you'll show, you know, uh, connect to one of our videos of of kids doing this. And what we've heard from older kids doing it in middle school is that, you know, by then anxiety is not a minor issue in a lot of places. And we had one teacher who's featured in this great video, uh, you know, our videos are like three minutes long, who thought that her kids were, this was back in twenty. 2018 or 19, it was before the pandemic, who saw her kids being more, she'd been teaching for 20 years, like the most anxious she had ever seen them. 
And, and she gave me an example on the phone because she was trying to lure me out to watch. <laughs> and she did because um, she's on Long Island. I'm in New York City. And the example she gave is that one time a kid came into the class. It was like lunchtime. And they hadn't had a chance to get lunch yet. And the teacher said, well, just go to the cafeteria and bring your lunch back. It's fine. You know, we're just doing games or whatever. And and the kid said, by myself. Right. And this is seventh grader. So so she was worried about them. And so she assigned uh, the let grow experience. They had the kids had to do 20 let grow projects over the course of a year. And so, OK, even if you're making pancakes one at a time and cookies another time, at some point you got to go to CVS, you got to climb a tree, you got to go to the park with your friends, you got to get yourself to, to church or to your ballet lesson or something. And the kids that I went and met um, were so freed. They were like, they were talking about like, I was so anxious, I could barely talk to people. And I go in these classrooms now and I see the kids barely talking, you know, whether they, you know, choked up behind their masks and never got it back or whatever. They're just, they're very, very quiet as if they're worried anything they say is going to be dumb or wrong. So they don't want to put themselves out there even to say anything. And these kids had done so much that they talked about how they just changed as people. And and one one girl was talking about how her favorite project was her parents had to take her brother for like an eye operation or something one morning that was very early. So they left her home. Remember, she's around 12 years old with her younger sister, who was, I think, in kindergarten. And so she had to get the girl her breakfast and get her backpack ready and get her ready to go out the door and then take her off to the bus stop. And when she did and the and her little sister got on the bus and was waving, you know, goodbye, the, the girl explained that she she herself was crying and she said, I just felt like I mattered. And, you know, what have we deprived our kids of? Yeah. Right. Not just independence, but if everything is done for you, you matter in that you're loved, but you don't matter in that you can help anyone. You know, you don't matter in that your parents trust you as a blossoming young human. You matter in that you're a delightful and endangered pet. And that's a different feeling. And so all these kids talked about one kid, we have his we have a screen grab from the teacher's phone that said, um, thank you so much. Now I'm off my meds. Yeah. Yeah. Powerful, powerful stuff. I want to make sure to uh, pull up uh, Peter's book here. So again, free to learn uh, right here. Um, I do have uh, my own uh, bookstore, bookshop.org. Um, and so I'll make sure to include this book along with your book. And also uh, The Anxious Generation is already out there on my bookshop. Um, so I'll be sure to do that. I also wanted to, you had mentioned it earlier uh, about uh, 34th, The Miracle 34th. Explain that a little bit, since I'm not from New York. Oh, this is the, you know, there's that movie, my favorite movie ever, uh, Miracle on 34th Street, possibly why I moved to New York. You know, the, the the funny thing about that movie is that it's so great. It's so charming. Watch the old version from the 30s, black and white, Fred Gwynn, Natalie Wood as a six-year-old. But the the phrase that gets repeated and turns out to be like the, you know, the, the main theme is that faith is believing when common sense tells you not to. And in that case, it's believing in Santa Claus. Somebody personally, I don't believe it, and I'm Jewish, but it was a nonetheless an extremely important movie for me. And I think that my whole life is faith is believing when a culture tells you not to. Our culture has told us not to believe in our kids, not to believe in our neighbors, not to believe that our kids can succeed at anything without us there, not to believe that Mother Nature created a very wonderful template for kids to be learning and curious and competent and able to withstand things. And instead, we think they can only deal with what has been curated through us, you know, the pre chewed food. And, and because you showed the Peter Gray um, book, I wanted to say the other Let Grow initiative that's also that we recommend schools do. And here I have to say also, I, you know, on my tombstone, it will be chiseled that Lenore introduced Jonathan Haidt to Peter Gray, because John spends a lot of his time talking about how we've replaced a play-based childhood with a phone-based childhood, and we have to get back to the play-based childhood. That's because he's been listening to Peter um, ever since we started Let Grow. And Peter says that when kids are playing, they you, you hear a lot of less than perfect interactions. 
You know, that's not fair. That team's not good. The ball was out. I'm bored. Oh, my God. What, you know, Sydney, you're bothering us. All the things that go on. I'd say that's not fair is probably, you know, the, the phrase uttered most in childhood when parents aren't there because they're trying to figure out what is fair. What does make sense? How can I assert my sense of what this game should be and how I see the world? And sometimes I'm going to lose and that's not fair. But I but Mother Nature put this drive to play in all kids that made it so enticing that like, OK, you can go first or OK, the ball was out, <laughs> you know, or yes, you can play with us, even though I don't like you because the teams are uneven and you're a great hitter. Whatever it is, there's there's so many compromises and so many ways to say, wait, 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 it'd be more fun if, you know, you don't if you wait three seconds and then you throw the ball. So it's articulating new ideas and compromising and communicating and being creative and and dealing with the frustration of dealing with other human beings, all that is done because that's how you get to the fun, right? The fun is so enticing, the play time. And when adults are with kids, they see the frustration and the stupidity and the immaturity because they're not mature yet. <laughs> and they say, oh, you guys are taking forever. Okay, the teams count off by you know twos and you're gonna be over here and you play first. And the adults, you know, whether that was spontaneous or whether it's an organized sport, feel like, phew, we're not wasting all our time. I mean, if we waited for them to organize the game, they'd have five minutes left to play. And so they think they've optimized the experience, but I think they've taken all the vitamins out of that experience because that's the, that interstitial time is when kids are learning all these social emotional learnings that we're now trying to teach them through curriculum in advisory or homeroom. It's like, okay, kids, turn to the person next to you and tell them one reason they're terrific. And so Let Grow suggests that we do Peter Gray's idea, which is keep all schools open before or after school or both for a decent swath of time, at least an hour, for mixed age free play in a no phone zone. And the way I was just describing it in my email to the Surgeon General, who I met last night, was that think of this as a, a wildlife sanctuary. You know, if you're worried about kids on phones, if you're worried about depression and anxiety and passivity and self-doubt, here's a way that they can interact. You don't have to interact with people you don't want to. You can be, you know, you can play, be playing, you know, drawing with chalk, that'd be me, <laughs> in the corner with one or two friends. And then there could be a big group of people that's, you know, playing soccer or four square or going to the swings or doing all these things in groups. And because it's mixed ages, that's more like humanity always was, which was, you know, we didn't, the, 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 the you know, the, the, on the Serengeti, they weren't saying, oh, you'll be seven in September. Well, you're not in this group yet, <laughs> right? It was a group of kids that as soon as a toddler could toddle along after them, they'd be desperately trying to keep up. And the older kids might reluctantly or proudly take care of them. Um, and then that toddler becomes one of the older kids. And one of the things Peter points out about mixed age play is that when it's just the seven-year-olds, it's the strongest seven-year-old or maybe the most obnoxious seven-year-old who's automatically the, the leader because they have actual leadership qualities. But if it's 10-year-olds down to three-year-olds, the 10-year-old who might be very shy is also the leader. And so everybody gets a chance to be, you know, uh, different positions in a society and you're interacting and you're figuring things out. And that is how you create a society that functions. And so the reason that John Haidt and Daniel Shuckman, who used to be the chairman of FIRE, which fights, for, which fights for free speech on campus, were talking to each other those five years ago when they were thinking about this, is that they felt like kids on campus had become so intolerant of feeling uncomfortable that they were mistaking it for being unsafe. And so they wanted, you know, trigger warnings and safe spaces, and they didn't want to hear ideas that they didn't already agree with. And both John and Dan were saying, you know, fighting for viewpoint diversity, which was one of John's first fights on campus is great, but it's a late stage intervention. What if we could raise kids who were so used to the sturm und drang of being together and figuring things out and making their own fun and being frustrated? What if we created kids from the get go who were open-minded and resilient and resourceful like that. And they said, wouldn't 
wouldn't that be better? You know, it's like prevention versus cure. And so that's when they came to me and said, you know, we love free range kids. Let's start this nonprofit. And then I said, bring in Peter. And so the Let Grow Play Club is the fruition of all that thinking. How can we get kids back together? So you keep the school open. There is an adult there for liability purposes for, you know, in case of an emergency, just like there's a lifeguard on a beach. But otherwise, the kids just have to make their own fun. And there's loose parts, right? There's there's hula hoops and, and footballs. And to channel that movie once again, uh, imagination is a big theme to that. And this, you know, gives uh, an opportunity for imagination because, you know, left to their own devices, they may come up with a completely new novel game that nobody, no adult would have ever conceived because they will use their creativity. Um, wait, wait so, I just have to tell you one story about that, that yeah. Peter heard, which was that when kids were back from covid they were playing a game called COVID, I think, or something or you know, illness. And if you if COVID touched you, you know, like basically it, if COVID touched you, you had to lie down on the ground because you were dead. But then somebody could come along and I think vaccinate you. And then you were back in the game. <laughs> and the teachers thought, oh, this is so morbid. And they cut it. They, they said, no, you can't play that. But obviously, this is how the kids were working through everything. Right. And before COVID, I mean, they were playing zombies. So same thing. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, um, right. So th- there's another 34th that uh, is a, a wonderful, wonderful story here. Oh, that's, and that's, yeah. that's that's 34th Avenue. And, and, and this is a, this is a manifestation of um, transformation of our public realm to be able to encourage you know, saw the, the gal holding up the, the, the sign, you know, children playing. And this gives people, an, or we're redefining what our streets are for here, which is a major, major theme, uh, you know, with the Active Towns Initiative and what we're trying to do worldwide is trying to get people to realize that really, you know, streets, streets are for people. They have been for people for, you know, thousands of years. It's the automobile that's the new interloper that came in about 100 years ago. And so these types of initiatives are, I think, incredibly important because it gives, I, I want to say, you know, I'm going to say this in a way that, you know, we can both argue and, and, and debate one way, but it gives, I, I think, parents a pass and creates a little bit of a safe space so that the kids can play. Look at all these kids playing. And I know that there's integration with lots of schools um, with this yeah, space, right. which I absolutely love. Talk a little bit about this, you know, this kind of transformation and this sort of uh, movement that's starting to happen because it's it's actually, like I said, it's like a physical manifestation of creating um, some space where uh, again, we sort of encourage, like Tim Gill is talking about urban playgrounds and, and like, no, we really want our urban fabric to be kid friendly, right. the entire city. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Um, I'll talk and then I also have to get off exactly at the half hour. Um, so, you know, why wouldn't you have more space for playing near a school? Uh, it was either, I think it was Tim who told me when I was helping John, right? So in the angst generation, there's a chapter for schools and there's a chapter for parents and I was helping write those. And so I was talking to, you know, active transportation people and city planners about, you know, what other ideas are great. And one of the ideas was it's so simple to block off the street in front of a school. And then even, yeah, this is in Paris, everything looks really much nicer than here. Um, But automatically you have enough space. Like my kids went to public school here in New York city and they, they were only allowed to run on the perimeter of the black, of the blacktop during their very short and horrible recess because there were so many kids. Well, why didn't they just, I didn't even think of this back then. Why didn't they block off, you know, one block in front of the school and you would have had this giant swath of space and then you don't have cars dropping kids off. So you don't have all the accidents of cars dropping kids off and, you know, running into the kids who have just been dropped off. And, and it's just a, it's a plaza in my neighborhood. Not only is the 34th street, become a play street that you were showing. Um, but there's also a street in the business district that used to be just another normal street and they blocked that off. They called it diversity plaza because we do have 167 languages spoken here in Jackson Heights. It's, it's a fantastic neighborhood in Queens. But now there's people selling stuff and there's people bringing their tea outside. And one one night I came out and 
they'd set up all these chairs and there was a big screen and it was the vice presidential debates, which I cannot imagine anything more boring personally. But, you know, there's people in, you know, hijabs and serapis and <laughs> fezes. I mean, it was just like it was it was like Ellis Island participating in democracy because there was a space for everybody to gather together. So gathering spaces are great. I mean, I wish I lived in the Azores where my son tells me every, you know, every Sunday from four to eight, you know, the whole town comes out to the plaza and the the younger kids flirt. And I guess the older people who have lost their spouses also flirt, let's hope. And maybe there's some people who are still alive and they just enjoy perambulating and talking. Um, but I love the idea of anything that creates community. And obviously having a place to gather is part of it, which is why I have to put in a good word again for the uh, for a Let Grow Play Club. So what you're doing is you're keeping after school some space at the school open for this mixed age, no devices, socializing. And the older kids, I just heard last night at this, this Surgeon General thing, a discussion with the Surgeon General, Surgeon General that um, a school that had banned phones, a middle school that had banned phones, said the teachers were most surprised by the outbreak of a lot of flirting and a lot of new boyfriend and girlfriend, you know, budding activity. And of course, because instead of looking down, you're looking up and you're interacting. So creating this, I mean, whether it's a, a, you know, a, 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 a through street or a play street or whatever you want to call it, or a let grow play club, you're getting people, you're giving people a space to gather and in a play club, you're giving them a specific time to gather either before or after school. And then there's people. That's that's the really key in, uh, ingredient for getting kids outside. They don't just care about the outside. They want to be where their friends are. They want to be doing stuff with people. And so it's just a simple recipe, but we don't have it now. And so kids get picked up and they either get driven home where they will remain on their screens, I promise you, until dinner, or they get taken to an adult run activity where once again, the the game is optimized, but the interactions are um, minimal or negligible. Certainly not as robust as they'd be if the kids were deciding on what to play themselves. Yeah, yeah, fantastic, Lenore. This has been so much fun. I, it's I, I'm I'm shocked that it's taken me this long to connect with yeah, you. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. um, again, this is your website, and uh, folks, if uh, please head on over to Let Grow. Uh, click on Join Now. Um, I believe you can sign up for a newsletter. I've been getting the the newsletter. Um, you know, yeah, in it's my like inbox. Blog posts. Yeah, yeah, blog posts, and, and and yeah, I guess that's probably. The terminology right exactly whatever it is it's me writing and writing and writing and writing so if you want to see more which is what same, you do <laughs> which is what you do and again i do have the books out here on the active towns bookshop so it's right there anxious generation and the free range kids and i'll be sure to get peter gray's book uh, right next to those two as well lenore thank you so much for joining me on the active towns podcast and thanks for showing my neighborhood i mean uh, and anybody who's coming to new york don't miss jackson heights queens yes and also yeah. let grow <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Yay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, John. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Lenore. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on the subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content here on the Active Towns podcast, please consider becoming an Active Towns ambassador. It's easy to do. Just head on over to activetowns.org. Click on the support tab at the top of the page. There's many different options, including becoming a Patreon supporter. Uh, patrons do get access to all this video content early and ad free. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. It really means so much to me. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.